Welcome to the program, both of you. It's a pleasure to have Good. you with Thanks. us. Thanks, Thank Laura. Um, just remind us, Richard, the Sustainable Business Council's been around how long? Who do you represent and why? Yeah. So we started in July of 2009. It's a national business advocacy group based in D.C., and we represent over 200,000 companies across the U.S., and um, those companies tend to be what we would call high road or triple bottom line companies. And the premise for starting the council was that those types of companies that are making money, that are treating their employees well, investing in their communities, concerned with the environment, historically they hadn't been well represented in the policy process, either in D.C. or at state capitals. And now? And now we're able to represent those companies across the uh, country, both on Capitol Hill and in state legislatures uh, across the country. And Mandy, coming to you, did I, did I summarize more or less accurately your situation? It's quite a story. You did. Um, we were the quintessential mom and pop. We started our business, we, my husband and I, in 1990 after discovering in my husband's native Denmark what we instantly recognized as the world's most comfortable shoe. Of course. And our first business plan went something like this. If you've got something great to share, you share it. And if in the sharing you can reinvest in more to share, you do that too, and the gift just keeps on giving. So that was the premise. And you did brilliantly, and I think at the last I looked, you had uh, annual revenues of something like 120 million, something like that? We did, we've been between 125 and 150. Um, we started with an initial investment of $7,500, um, proceeds from the sale of a young horse. My husband and I were horse trainers. And we kept sharing this incredible find, um, magnets of serendipity that we, that we are and uh, very consumer driven and we evolved and came up with new designs and new programs and, and expanded from the $7,500 investment to a high watermark of 150 million with uh, 150 employees. Most people when they get an offer for their company from an enormous competitor, Timberland, a hundred million dollar offer would have said yes. It was a little north of that but I didn't want, it wasn't public information, so I, All right. I, I low-balled it a bit. So but tell me how, what, what, how that played out. What happened? Well, the hundred million is important in one regard, not to tie it to the offer, but because we had reached that magical, mythical level at which entrepreneurs are said to start failing. And I bought it. I bought that hook, line, and sinker, and I had a crisis of confidence, frankly, that I could take the, com the company um, to the next level. We were truly the quintessential mom and pop. We homeschooled our, our staff. We homeschooled our baby Dansko. Um, we followed her through toddlerhood into school age, into revolutionary teenager, into adulthood, and realized that we really were gonna need some outside help. And this prospective purchaser had the same values we had. They had financial modeling that we could only imagine. They had international sales and distribution and R&D, all of those things. And we thought that their public commitment to doing well by doing good was a perfect match for us. Sounds good. Um, what happened? What really got me was this nagging concern that I was selling my baby down the river because I didn't know how to raise her. And how lame was that? Mm -hmm. I was going to need to pull on my big girl pants and be a CEO and surround myself with folks that really knew what they were doing. And the fact that we were not willing to sell out, but that we wanted to keep jobs local, that we wanted to keep our culture uh, intact, that we wanted to keep our North Star, um, protect our family. That was very appealing for a lot of folks who had had experience in our industry in much larger frequently public corporations. So what you decided to do in the end was to sell how much of your company to the workers? 100 percent. We made that transaction all in one fell swoop. How significant is this story? It's increasingly uh, common and there's a trend across the economy where owners of companies and founders are looking to democratize the workplace. And so 
when the American Sustainable Business Council hears these types of stories, we like to hold them up and really suggest that this is what success looks like in the American economy and that companies can be financially successful, also really committed to the workforce, provide great benefits, uh, commit to environmental stewardship, and there's nothing inconsistent about that. And that's actually what successful capitalism looks like in the 21st century. Elaborate a little on how it helps combat poverty and income inequality. Well, I'll say something, and then Mandy, I'm sure, will have a thought as well. But um, the fact that many workers don't have adequate earnings, um, nor do they have a retirement plan uh, because their company hasn't set one up, is a real barrier to people's financial success and their being able to get, you know, move from uh, lower income to middle income. So ESOPs are able to set, you know, they, they create a pathway for people to have a future retirement plan. Um, and that workers who are given, as in Mandy's case, you know, an opportunity to own a part of the company, all of a sudden can launch themselves into a much better financial place in the future. Well, and that helps to reduce the, the you know, income gap. At the end of the day, employees are the lifeblood of our business. Mm -hmm. They are our business. They solve problems. They answer the phone. They design product. They're innovative. They're creative. They're, they are truly now invested they are the investors in our business. What is the significance of your story and how do you see this sort of new economic model um, affecting our political scenario, our political scene? Mandy, Richard? It's important in this moment where we're having this conversation about restructuring the economy and some of the priorities that the Trump administration and, and a GOP controlled Congress have to look at these types of stories because we're quite convinced that the path that the Republican Congress and the Trump administration is heading down is not going to benefit the middle class, it's not going to raise boats, and that their definition of success is inconsistent with environmental stewardship, with equality, really with opportunity, and that the work of progressive, responsible businesses is really the trajectory of the American economy. So there are, it's a hard road ahead, but our goal is really to present to legislators and to the media these types of stories and say, hey, this is what success looks like in the future. You can be part of it. Thank you both. Mandy Cavett, Richard Eidlin, really, real honor to be with you. Good. Thanks for Thanks, coming Laura. on the program. Thank you very much. You're watching The Laura Flanders Show.